and you can put a face to a name. So that's me, and that is Julie below me. Um, oh, and just as a reminder, Julie, once we're done the introductions, if you want to start the recording, that'd be great. I have started so, the recording, thank you. Terrific. So you all are in the Mysteries of the Library Revealed webinar, and tonight we're going to cover search terms. My name is Andrea Lemieux. I'm a reference librarian here at Walden University. Julie James is here with me, and she will be helping me to present and field questions. Um, she is one of our health sciences librarians here at Walden. If you use our Ask a Librarian service, either send us questions via email or chat with us you'll often see our names as well so now you can put some faces to those names and hopefully we've worked with some of you students um, before and if not we'll work with you guys in the future so we're going to turn off our webcams because it uses a little bit of bandwidth but we just wanted to say hi now we're going to say goodbye all right so let's get started if you have attended these Mysteries of the Library Revealed in the past, terrific. If this is your first one, you've picked an excellent one because this is really the basis to just about everything you're going to do in the library. We hold these webinars once a month um, on the third Thursday at 8.30 in the evening. And we have two more scheduled, so June 18th and July 16th, search alerts and journals. Just as a reminder, even if you are not sure if you can attend the webinar, please do register because what happens is you will get a link to the webinars a few days after. And so it's just a good reminder to watch it if for some reason you weren't able to attend. So just a few reminders there. So like I said, if this is your first Mysteries webinar that you're attending, you picked an excellent one because everything we do with library databases depends on keywords. So these are the objectives that hopefully you are going to um, leave with tonight at the end of the webinar. First is identifying keywords in an assignment prompt or research topic. Combining keywords to narrow or broaden your search results. And then to develop more keywords, you can use subject terms and we're going back a little old school and using a thesaurus. So those two we're going to be covering as well, and as well as using field searching to search a specific article. So Julie, just as a reminder, you can mute your mic. I think we might be picking up your keyboard. Sorry. And you're a fast typer, so we're all really impressed over here because I can hear those keys going. Okay, so you might be asking yourself, what are keywords? And if you've ever, again, used our Ask a Librarian service, we might send you a sample or example search, and we'll always say the first thing, develop some keywords. So let's talk about what a keyword is and isn't because that's really the basis of what we're going to do. So to show you what a keyword is and isn't, sometimes it's easier to just show you you an example. So I'm going to bring up on my screen the handout that is also available for you to download and this works through the search that we're going to do in the first half of the webinar. So let's assume that this is our assignment prompt up here. The first part of it is what are teachers attitudes on standardized testing? Well if we copy that and we go over to Google for instance we can type that whole sentence into Google, including the question mark, punctuation, and it's going to bring us relatively relevant results. I mean, not always, I'm sure you all know this, and it's going to actually bring us up over 2 million results. You can see summer journal articles at the top. Most of these aren't going to be in full text but it's going to refer to them and then some of these are teacher resources here at the bottom so you're going to get a variety of different things and that's all because google is set up to use keyword searching um, I'm sorry, it's set up to use sort of more natural language searching to pick these things up in websites and website coding and those kinds of things. So that's how Google works. So let's go over to our library databases and see what happens if we're to do the same thing in a library database. Now we're not going to talk really much about library databases tonight per se. That's another webinar, another mysteries webinar that's recorded that you can watch. But just as a reminder, we typically start here in this box under subject resources and we pick a topic most related to what we are searching. So we're going to click on education. And that's going to bring us to our education page where everything you need to know about Walden the Walden Library and education resources is on this page. So this first 
drop down menu, we're going to pick one of the best bet databases. So the first one listed is Education Source. So we're going to pick that. And hopefully you're familiar with this layout. The database is Education Source, but it's an EBSCO database, which means that's the company that sells us this product. And so the interface is really the same a um, with a lot of our EBSCO databases. So let's go ahead and just type the whole thing into the search box and click search. Oh, wonderful. We get absolutely no results compared to 2 million in Google. Well, that's honestly one of the reasons why students opt to use Google instead of databases because they're not sure how, why they're getting zero results and how the database is working. They're much more familiar with Google. And the reason that is, is based on keywords. So all keywords means is we need to break down this sentence into ideas and concepts that we're going to put into each separate box. So the best way to explain that is to show you what I mean by that. So let me delete this and we're going to start from the beginning. And delete, there we go, okay. So if we are to look back at our topic, what are teachers' attitudes about standardized testing, one of the main ideas is teachers. So we're gonna type that into the first search box. The next is attitudes. So we're getting rid of all the what, ands, question marks, punctuation, and we're breaking it down into one idea or concept per search box. And the last one was standardized testing. Okay, so typically when we search our databases, just as a reminder, we typically click full text and peer reviewed. Um, it might depend based on your assignment, but just as a reminder, we usually click those two checkboxes off. And let's, let's click search and see what happens. Wow, great, okay, so we get 74 results here. A lot more than zero and a lot less than two million. So we're doing pretty good right out the gates. So this is a pretty basic search. This is how you start off. And if you're new to using the library and you get this far and you can complete your assignment, terrific. But we're gonna go into a few more advanced skills that hopefully you'll be able to use as you progress in your course of study here at Walden. Now, if we're to look back at the prompt, we're gonna ignore part of it, but the second part of it says, choose a research article that focuses on a specific methodology of your interest. Well, let's say that you're um, a dissertation student and you're interested in case studies and you wanna know more about what the format of a case study looks like. Well, we're gonna go ahead and click this plus button over here and that's gonna give us one more search box. Now we have 74 results because our search is pretty broad. So we're gonna type in case study and as a reminder, and this is also all on the PowerPoint, is that the more words you enter into the search boxes, the more narrow your results. Because this and box over here. So what this search means, before I click the search button, we're telling the database that we want to find only articles that have the words teachers and attitudes and standardized testing and now case study. If it doesn't have, if it's missing one of those words, it's not going to bring up the article. So know that our articles, once we click search, we went from 74, now we have case study. Now let's see what happens. Wow, okay, so that reduced it quite a bit to four results because the article has to mention all four of those. Okay, so now if you were able to download the PowerPoint, if not, it's all there and it's all in the handout. The second step to developing a really great search in our databases is to start brainstorming all the synonyms and related concepts that you can think of. And the reason for that is, is because these articles mention the word teachers, but what if they mentioned educators or instructors or professors? So we're going to brainstorm as many alternative words as we can think of and separate them with this or. And I'm gonna explain what that means, but we're gonna separate them all by the word or. Now, what else can you think of as far as attitudes? What other words are, they, are there that mean the same thing as attitudes? Well, there's views, beliefs, perceptions, 
Now, before I click search, let's talk about what this means now that we've added a lot more ideas. So this search means that the article needs to have one of these words. It can have more, but it has to have at least one. It has to have teachers or educators or instructors, etc. And it has to have one of these words in the second box. And don't forget, it has to also have standardized testing and case study. Now we've added more words in as options, so let's see what this four results turns into when we click search. Okay, great, it increased our results. And the reason for that is, is because again, this talks about per teacher perceptions. Maybe later on in our results list, we see an article that talks about instructors or professors. Okay, so we've got through step one, brainstorm synonyms and related concepts, or I'm sorry, break your topic into keywords. The second one was brainstorm synonyms or topics. Now the next one, there's two more questions you wanna ask yourself, and, it, and this is getting a little bit more complicated. So again, the more practice you have searching our databases, the easier this is become, will become. But again, if you are right here at this point and can replicate this with your own search topic, you're doing really fantastic. So the problem with standardized testing is, is what if we said, what if an article talked about standardized tests or standard tests? So those are just different forms of the same word. Now, typically our databases will search tests or tests, but it's not going to search testing and test. Typically, I'm, I'm speaking a little bit in generalizations here, just so you know. So what we're going to do is we're going to take off the part of the word that is different among the different ways we can say standardized testing. And we're going to put an asterisk at the end. And how I do that is I push shift on my keyboard and the 8 key, and that gives us what we call an asterisk. We're going to do that with standard as well, and we're going to take off everything at the end that's going to be different between standards, standardized, and we're going to put an asterisk there. Now let's look at all of our other words. These words up here are okay because they're all plural and the database will search singular or plural, typically if it has just an S, but the problem with case study is that, of course, plural is IES. So on this, we're going to want to use the asterisk again, and that's going to let us search case study or case studies with the IES. Okay, 16 results. Let's go ahead and click search. Okay, 38 results, great. So it picked up a few more results that might have used standardized test or standard tests and case studies in the article. Now, again, if you refer back to your PowerPoint, there's one more step we need to do, um, or we could do, you might find something for your assignment in the first page or so of results, so you're, you'd be doing okay at this point. Another question to ask yourself is, are any of these words that you see in the search boxes, are they phrases? Do you typically see them together with another word back to back, not separated? Well, again, these last two we do. Standardized testing is going to always, for the most part, be stuck together when you see it in the first few results. Um, and then, case studies is the same. So to keep them together as a phrase, we're going to put them in quotation marks. And just as an FYI, this also works in Google. So this is a great technique to use in Google and it will also help you narrow down those 2 million results. Okay, so we have the quotation marks. We're at 38 results. Let's see what happens when we click search. All right, great, so now we're at 28, so a little bit more narrow. It got rid of any articles that might have mentioned case in the title and maybe study somewhere down in another part of the article. So I'm just going to go back to the PowerPoint really quickly. We talked about step one, break down your topic into keywords. Step two, brainstorm synonyms and related concepts. Step three was, does your keyword have more than one form? And here's an example. And step four, is it a word or a phrase? And that's an example as well. We talked about search box basics. 
and we talked about how and and or are used in the database. I mentioned not here, but again, we typically don't use that, so for right now, I wouldn't even worry about ever including not in your search. We can help you out if you get stuck on something like that. So without um, any more further ado, I should say, I'm gonna turn this over to Julie, and she's gonna talk about a few other ways to develop more keywords and to search the database even more specifically with the additional keywords that you can find. So please take it away, Julie. Thank you, Andrea. Can you see my screen? Can you see the blue? Okay. Well, that was a great summary of how to combine keywords to develop your search strategy. Um, it can be overwhelming. Yes, we understand that, but you are picking up a lot of little skills here that are going to be very useful for you all the way down the line. So when we were looking at these hit lists with the subject terms underneath them, that's what I want to talk about next is the subject terms and how to use them to the best effect. So we have this education source search here, and if we scroll all the way to the bottom, get rid of that. If we scroll all the way to the bottom here, we can look at some of these other subject headings. So you pick out the articles that are most relevant to whatever it is that you're studying. So look at the subject headings for the articles that are really good. And that may give you some other ideas of terms that you hadn't thought of, whether it be um, a particular type of learning or teaching or measuring those types of skills. This can be a great way to find more um, search terms like school administrator attitudes was not included in some of our other um, some of our, our other searching there. So note any relevant terms when you come along that you might not have thought of or something that sparks your interest because you will want these notes later. Trust me, if, especially if you are doing a master's thesis or a dissertation, you may need to redo these searches a couple of times. So you want, might want to take notes on what works and what doesn't work. And then when you get to your writing center, uh, appointment and they ask for that literature search matrix on what you searched, you will be um, absolutely ready for that. And this is one of my favorite way to, ways of discovering the terms is just by looking at the subject headings of the articles that I did find. But some people like to have a little bit more of a structure to their um, browsing or their searching of terms. And we have thesauri in most of the databases. In EBSCOhost, you'll see the subject terms across the top of the, of the um, window here. And then in ProQuest databases, it's a little farther down, just above the search box. And the thesaurus is just like the old paper, paper thesaurus to give you alternate terms for what you're using and to what is the official subject heading, what is the accepted terminology for that particular concept. And so if I look for the concept of an I, I've copied out three different databases here. Medline is a medical databases, medical database that uses medical subject headings. And it's very, very specific to medic. Um, medicine and uh, uh, the affiliated um, allied health services. So if you look at that under sense organs, the eye is represented under there and then it has several um, pretty complicated subheadings under it. When I went to Academic Search Complete, which is a very general database, it just had a couple of, um, of eye words here. And then when I was in ProQuest Central, I noticed it had things like eye care products, eyeglasses. ProQuest is uh, ProQuest Central is a much more general database that has um, quite a lot of popular magazines in it. So you'll see things like that. But if I am, for instance, if I'm going to my doctor and I have a problem with dysphobia centralis in my eye, I kind of would like the doctor to be able to search everything on that topic. So that's why the medical subject headings are so precise so that the um, medical care providers can really be thorough in their searches there. And I did find a little bonus 
when I went to ProQuest Central um, earlier today, I was really thrilled to see that they, um, when I asked for their thesaurus, they asked, would you like to use the ProQuest thesaurus or the mesh heading? So I was really uh, happy to see that they gave me the choice of which thesaurus to use. And anything that is related to the body, medicine, um, or science may be uh, worth looking at mesh. Okay. And Julie, I was just going to point out as well that if you're bringing up your database, we're still seeing your PowerPoint. Um, right, right. I'm talking well. about. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't think it would be a great use of our time to go in and look at these three databases. So I just copied out the subject headings so that you could see them. They're pretty straightforward in actually searching each of these thesauri on their own. Um, it's not that much harder than reading a thesaurus in a book. So um, we are looking at all of these subject headings and then what are we going to do with them? That's when we get to the field searching. And there's quite a few fields in the record in these, um, in these articles, but the most used fields when you're searching field specific are subject and author. And that comes from the olden days. Do you, anybody remember what these things do or what they used to do? Um, once upon a time, the library would would um, take each title and categorize it by title, author, and subject and give you three access points to that. And that's where the databases are coming with these fields. So you can select a field here and it has author, title, subject, and then it has a lot more underneath it. That's in the EBSCO databases. And you can see in the ProQuest databases, it, they're a little bit different. The wording is a little bit different. Sometimes the abbreviations or the scope of what it is that they're searching is a little bit different. So that's something to be aware of, that they are very, um, they can be different from each other, but they can be figured out if you just kind of look for this SU subject, AU author, and then some of the other ones. I have tried using some geographic terms in here that can be useful. Um, they have people in EBSCO, but person in ProQuest Central, and sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't, but it's really good to know about the subject and author term specifically. And then we will go over to the browser and we'll, we'll go back to the library homepage here. And just as an example, I will select Academic Search Complete because it is a, a nice general database. And I tried this search with probably about two dozen different people. There are lots of people in our world that are written about, but then also do some writing. And that's when you start to use some of these field searching. And one of the best examples I could come up with is for myself. If I put in my own name here, I can see that. If I don't put it in quotes, we find all kinds of extra people between us. So if I put quotes around my name, it gets it a lot closer in here. And we'll take it, let's see, it's still thinking about it. We'll take it down from 160 results where it finds any of those two words, literally, down to 13 results. And this first one happens to be a hit. This happens to be something that I was interviewed for a long, long time ago when I first started teaching. And it was um, a fun project to do. So this isn't really, I'm not a subject of that particular article. I am um, a sidebar on it. And if you wanna wait for it to load, it does have some pictures of me from 16 years ago. So coming back to um, our hit list here, the second one has a James Julie, but she's the romance writer that came on the screen about 10 years ago. Not something that I wanted to appear in my search. So this is where I can say, I don't want the word romance to appear in my search because I personally never wrote any romance novels or something that would have the word romance in it. But we see some other things here like detoxification and mud baths and some Australian things. So it's like, well, if I'm doing, if I'm doing research on this researcher and I would like to see things um, that they have done, then I will go, whoops, then I will go up here and instead of the not romance, I will put and library because um, that will find librarian, libraries, um, all sorts of uh, variations on the word library. So we can take those quotes back off 
whoa, that's weird. Okay. Um, <laughs> so we can take the quotes back off because I wanted to show you that they do something a little bit different in this database. Um, we'll leave the quotes on and see what that comes up with. If it does not like to go. Well, oh, I see. It's just showing me the history of my results. And then you just click on one to show the results. So it's showing, um, you can see all the different searches we did here. I must have clicked on the search history and I wish it would go away now. Okay, there we go. Now, if we take the quotes off, it finds something different. And that is where I start to get, um, I start to get really kind of paranoid and I start to take notes because I want to know what it is that I did differently. When I come back, you know, next week and start doing some more searches, what was it that was different? And this first one is not me because it's somebody, Julie M. This was the one we just saw. And then that one's not me either. But then we do get some that are me down here farther. But my name is, says James, comma, Julie. So that can be different in different databases. We'll handle that differently. So that's something that you need to make a note of as to whether you put quotes around it as a phrase or whether you let it find the words individually. Okay, does that make sense? Um, you don't want to get too uh, caught up in one way of expressing something. So if we go to author and we list these two words as an author, it comes a little bit closer. You can see the product pipeline is one of the um, review columns that I did for several years. And so these are all mine. I did do some cookbook reviews and some articles about that too. So this is pretty good, but I feel like I've done more than 45. So let's go to another database, ProQuest Central. And if we do the same thing here, you'll see that they it's hitting a different set of journals, but it's also hitting um, in a different way. ProQuest and EBSCO have different search algorithms and are super secret and um, and they that's what costs us the big bucks are the uh, how these things do their searches. Okay, so you can see with just those two search boxes, we now have 52,000 results and that's just not right. That is way, way more than um, I should have because I really didn't publish that much. So we could try it putting in quotes. We can do it this way. We can do it that way. But I'm going to take a tip from our last one and I'm going to say, let's do an author without the quotes around it and see what happens. And then um, with the library to uh, indicate my profession. And when I looked through these, almost every single one of them were mine. Um, there were two or three that were not, but see, this is a much bigger search set than the last one we had. So you really do need to search multiple databases when you want to be thorough, but you need to keep track of which techniques work better in which databases, okay? Because they do work differently and they're all based on different mathematical um, calculations. But see, that if you go do that same search in Google, you'll get four billion mazillion hits and it's like taking all three of those card catalog sets and dumping them into a large bin to pull out any instance of those words. So, so that's field searching. There are quite a lot of other fields in there that we looked at. Um, you know, the geographic terms may be useful from time to time, but don't get too caught up in a particular country or a particular city. You may need to look at the region and go a little bit broader than that. Uh, but these can be really useful when you want to know exactly what's published on any particular topic. And definitely not a feature in Google. So here's what we did. We're almost out of time, but I just wanted to tell you um, in summary, we identified keywords in the assignment prompt. We combined keywords to narrow and broaden search results with more keywords to narrow down and fewer keywords to broaden their search results. And then we identified related keywords using those subject terms and the thesaurus can help you identify related terms as well or a broader term if you're not getting enough results. And then we use field searching to search a specific part of an article to only find that word in that context, which can be really, really helpful. So coming up in the series, when you have developed that perfect search, like that one that I did that was almost entirely my articles, I'm going to save that search 
and I'm going to create a search alert. And what it's going to do is send me an email anytime anything with those parameters are published. And to learn that, you can sign up, sign up for our search alerts webinar on Monday, June 18th. And then we'll be doing journals on July 16th when you can go straight into a journal and follow the journals that you're particularly interested in. Okay. So did we get overload your brain? What questions do you have for us? Andrew? So we'll take some questions. We don't have any questions right at the moment, but we're going to go ahead and stop the recording so that we can um, send you the link out for this. And then we will hang around for maybe about another five minutes or so to see if we have any questions. So Julie, if you can stop the recording, that'd be great. And right now we don't have we're still waiting for some questions so we will hang out for a few minutes okay well you can always review the webinar again you can um look for, we will also have the transcript and the powerpoint on the website very shortly so do we have a question in there no Oh, um, yeah. Just some technical issues navigating around GoToWebinar. Okay. Well, we can also send it to the email if you if you're not finding it in the GoToWebinar. Some people, um, if your if your GoToWebinar panel is minimized, you'll see a little orange arrow pointing to the right. So look for that to get your um, GoToWebinar meeting. Oh, it'll point to the left when it's hidden. And that one, that way it'll do. Oh, we do have a good question from Muhammad asking, what do we do if the article is available? It is unavailable. And that is um, for people that are not working on a discussion assignment that needs to be done by midnight tonight. We can get that article for you, but it takes seven to 10 days for us to get it from another library. Okay, so if you go to uh, services on the library homepage and go to document delivery service, that will tell you how um, that happens. All and just right. as a reminder, when I showed the original search, um, just keep in mind that depending on what your assignment is, you probably want to limit a lot of your searching to full text. So if you caught the, be the very beginning of my search when I was in the landing page for the database, there was a checkbox for full text and a checkbox for peer-reviewed articles. So if you're doing a weekly assignment or discussion, that's usually going to work great. And then as Julie said, if you're um, a dissertation student, student or a doctoral student um, and you need something for longer term research, we can always get the article for you um, at another library if we don't have the article. So just keep that in mind depending on your purpose. All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming and look for an email um, in the next 24 hours or so and we'll send you the uh, link to the recording. I think there's just one more question, Julie, if you wanted okay. to. Um, ah, is there an easy way to quickly check articles without fully opening them? Oh, yes. Um, you can uh, look at the abstract while you are, um, what, without, you don't have to look at the PDF. You can look at the HTML version, which usually opens up much quicker, but the abstract, if you click the title of the article, the abstract will show up and then you can um, just see if that's worth falling down the PDF. Okay, thank you.